Hello everybody, thank you for joining us. Tom Matuska here with the Matuska Tax Relief Supply Company. Um, Amber, Amber Ingalls once again. And uh, we're gonna continue on with our Bobcat project. Um, if you joined us last week and I think the week before, are we on my third, third one? Maybe, yeah. um, this is about our third one. Um, you don't just mount a Bobcat in 45 minutes per week. <laughs> um, so anyway, we're doing this Bobcat project step by step by step and uh, hopefully you'll learn something from it. Uh, last week, um, Amber set these ears, and these are, um, fly on her ears. Um, this is uh, um, the Gary Zayner um, Bobcat ears. They're fabric form. Um, the nice thing about those is you can heat them with uh, uh, a heat gun or you can heat them with hot water and you can shape them any way that you want. Um, they'll look something like this and you can put a little uh, backward flip on it for the ears that are back. You can close them up. Um, you can open them up depending on what kind of attitude that you want. And uh, so those are set in critter clay. Now we treat those much like we do a deer ear. Um, we set them and then cover them with, uh, we use Dermagrip and a couple coats of Dermagrip on there will hold all that clay on there so that when you cut around there, you can remove the nice earbud that she built on here. And um, that will remain, if you're careful, and you can glue it into the ear skin and it will index right back onto the, the form and all your muscling and all your uh, buildup in your ears and your ear muscle, ear bases are all already there. Um, so that's been done. Um, and I think you're gonna set eyes today. Yep. And we're gonna put um, reflective eyes. We like to use the reflective eyes on, on our uh, um, predators, like our um, bears, bobcats, coyotes. Um, yeah, wolves, They're, it's really an attractive, attractive eye. Um, they're made in Russia. And uh, there's a couple different versions. There's a flat, flat back version, which is um, still very reflective, but not as reflective as the one with the capsule. Um, Amber has the capsule one there and they have a little bit of depth to them and you can shine a light in them and they, they really reflect back. Um, customers uh, go crazy over them. They think they're really realistic and it's not, it's not a phony reflective. It's, it's a very realistic reflective um, look that you get out of the reflective eyes and they're not all that expensive, not much more than a glass eye. They're, they're an acrylic eye. And uh, so anyway, we're gonna use those on, on this Bobcat. And uh, we also drilled out and shaped the nostril last year, or last week. We used a uh, uh, reference cast and um, kind of followed that. And you have to leave enough room because you're gonna be tucking in. Bobcat nose skin is a little bit thick for the size of the nostril that you have. So you can leave yourself a little more of an opening to compensate for the thickness of the skin. And uh, I think you cut the lip line last, last week. And we did that with either a, you can go back and look, but either a little tiny drill bit or else a very small lip slot cutter. Um, that's a nice tool to use too. And uh, so do you want to get started with the uh, eyes? Eye setting, sure. And then also, don't forget, uh, it's really nice if you're setting eyes to have your animal standing like he's gonna be standing um, in the customer's house. Oftentimes, we will find out, um, say it's a mountain lion that's gonna be laying on a rock. I wanna know how high that rock is in the room because you, you want that animal to look at the viewer. And if he's looking over everybody's head, um, you lose the effect of you know how cool that animal is in his eyes. Or if he's looking at their feet, um, you kind of look at you know, what he's looking at. Um, sometimes you have multiple animals. Um, we had a, a student one time that had a raccoon up on a fence post and two coyotes attacking it. And we tried to get him to get the mannequins all completed, set eyes on all of them so they're interacting um, with their vision. And uh, the raccoon was scared to death and he was looking over the, bob or over the um, coyote's heads and one coyote was looking off to the side and the other coyote was looking up in the air and not one of the animals was looking at each other. It ruins the entire piece. So we like to have something like this 
about the height that the customer's going to have it, find out, ask them, you know, is it going on a fireplace mantle, is it going on a shelf, is it going on the floor, because it will make a difference when you set your eyes. And um, it doesn't work the best. You can do it. You can set your eyes by holding the animal in your lap, but it's way more effective and accurate if you have him like this. So Amber built this nice base. We have, uh, um, and this, this branch did not conform to the Bobcat's feet. Um, this is just uh, what foam and Mondo, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah. That she sculpted back in, and that looks just every bit as good as the real log. You can't tell one from the other. And we'll add some more. We'll add some debris on there, and we'll add maybe a little vine and some ground clutter. And uh, the customer's not going to know where the real started and the uh, fake started. Um, so now I interrupt you. Go ahead and you can tell them about eyes. Okay, so first, before before I set eyes, I typically like to have the area up around there roughed up, and it, it's not necessary, but I do like to take a form rougher on these small mammals. Um, I like to use a small form rougher, the mini form rougher, and just scratch up that area. Um, before we mount, we would want this to be all roughed up anyways, and for me, it's easier to be able to rough that surface now, at least right next to the eyes, instead of doing it afterwards when you're worried about bumping clay. So I do like to come in and just get a little bit of rough going on. You can do the rest of the face later, but I prefer to do right up by where our clay work is now. And it'll kind of help the clay stick a little bit better. It looks like we have a lot of people checking in saying hi. We have Roger Lawson from Central Texas, um, Marco Reyes with BBD Taxidermy. It looks like Denny Riggs from Houston, Missouri. And then I saw Blake Gronerwig that said hi to the both of you. Hi, hi, um, so hello everybody that is checked in. Make sure to give this video a like and share and also comment in the comment sections when you are done with that. Um, thank you all for tuning in so far. Yeah. All right, and so the next thing I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to cut out a little indention in the front corner. I'm going to kind of look a lot of your mannequins. Most mannequins will have a little area down here that kind of gives an idea of where the front corner of the eye would be. I like to come in and make a void in there to allow room for the carnacle to be able to sit. Um, and the carnacle is that little, that little ball of flesh in the very front corner, and you know we've got them too, um, that kind of sits back inside. And if you don't carve out that foam, then it sits out too far, and it makes it difficult to really get a good realistic look on your eyes. So I like to kind of take out that space. In fact, I'd rather have too much there taken out because I can always fill it back in with clay. Better, better to take out too much and not enough in that area for me. Usually less is best, but. Now, um, depending on the eyes, right now we're going to be using these reflective eyes and they're acrylic. And every eye style is a little bit different. So like if you would use the Tohican glass eyes, this white base is a little bit bigger. And sometimes even though even though the pupil area is small enough to fit in there, sometimes that white base is a little bit too big and it gets caught on this mannequin edge. So in, if that's the case, then I would come in and maybe take out a little trench in there and just kind of give room for that eye to be able to sit in. With these eyes, it typically isn't a problem. They're, the white isn't real world wide. So I just kind of like to give myself a little bit of breathing room. Now, also with these eyes we're using, kind of like Tom said, we're using the reflective eyes that have got that bubble on the back that allow for more reflective properties to show. So we want to be able to set that part into the mannequin. Right now, if we would try to set this, it'd look like his eye was being pushed out of his head too far. So we need to take away some of that foam in there in order to let that eye set in. So I'm just gonna kinda take this knife here, or you could even use a drill bit, you know, take it out, get it out however you can. 
And there's so many different um, mannequins and eyes on the market and being in the mannequin business, sure. um, you kind of have to make a decision on what are people gonna want. Um, this is one of our heads that we transplanted onto this body and any of our heads, um, we typically leave a large enough diameter eye socket mm -hmm. to accommodate um, like the good glass eyes with the scleral membrane around. Not everybody uses those. So if you use just the iris glass eye, you're gonna have a much smaller eye for the diameter of the, of the eye plate back there. So make sure that when you set them, um, you get your levels the right. same. Um, if you're using a scleral band, they will fit right in and you don't have to worry about that. But if you're using just the iris eyes, um, make sure that you don't get one eye higher, smaller, or lower than the other. Sure. Looks like Todd Buchanan says hello from Fairland, Indiana. Hello. Hi. And I was just going to do one eye, but then I thought about it. And if I'm going to be doing this, I'm going to want them to match. And then it's going to be difficult and I'll end up having to go backwards. So I'll probably just get this. Anybody one. can set an eye, but not everybody can set two the same. Yeah, that's always the trick. It's always the trick, isn't it? And for all our live viewers, don't forget that you can ask any question that you have in the comment section and we will answer them live for you. So don't be afraid. Nope. And while Amber's getting ready and cutting that out, um, we have our Bobcat skin sitting here. And with any of our small animals, we like to tan them ourselves. Um, I get kind of panicky sending fragile skins to the tannery. Um, I've had them come back in not as good a shape as we sent them. Yeah. So we think we do a really nice job. Um, we like to use uh, Lutan F. We use a lot of Lutan F for our small animals um, with a formic acid pickle. So we flesh the hides, turn the ears, split the lips, car cartilage out of the center of the nose, split your eyes, take all the fat and meat off, and salt them very, very well. Make sure that you mark them so you know um, what customers is which. Put a tag on them. And we usually don't dry them to, you know, potato chip consistency, but we do um, dry them for a day to two. And then we put them into a formic acid pickle. And our recipe is uh, uh, if we do a larger pickle, it'll be a 20 gallon pickle. I think we use 13 ounces of formic acid, mm -hmm. um, a splash of bactericide. 13 pounds of salt, 13 okay. gallons of water. Um, so that's the formic acid pickle. The formic acid will stiffen all of your skin uh, and it'll make it really easy for a knife or any kind of a fleshing tool to flesh that skin around the lips, take the cartilage out of the nose. They're really easy to work with coming out of a formic acid pickle. There's safety pickles and safety acids and oxalic acids, citric acids. Um, everybody will have their favorite. We like our acid pH to be about a 2.0. Um, and once it's in that pickle, it's very, very safe. And you can work with it, put it back in the pickle, bring it out a week from now, work on it again. Um, you don't have to do it all in one setting. From there, we neutralize these and then we put them into um, a tan. Like I said, we use a Lutan F, and that's one ounce of Lutan F per gallon of water per pound of salt. It's one to one to one. Um, we put them into the tan, and on a bobcat, overnight is plenty good. And we get really nice, long-lasting, um, really nice hair holding. Um, you don't, for small animals, you don't really need a fleshing machine, you can do most of it by hand because they're small enough and you don't have to thin them near as much. Um, and then, we oh, we also oil them. We oil them afterwards and yep. then we like to dry them. Some people just freeze them, put them uh, in the refrigerator overnight, you know, and mount them the next day. We like to uh, dry them completely and then rehydrate them. And uh, we get a really, really nice hide plenty of stretch, we get plenty of girth in the legs. Um, real nice, I don't wanna say rubbery, but there's plenty of stretch to them. And once they're mounted, um, we also wash them, shampoo them, and our fur, we think it turns out luxurious. Yeah. Yep. So that's how we take care of the height. Okay, didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 no. Um, 
<coughs> okay, so once I, I already went ahead and kind of popped one eye in, I'll show you what I usually do for my eyes. And I usually do this for the other kind of hollow eyes too, for like, for like your Tohican glass eyes or some of the payer eyes or different, different kind of eyes. I would fill it and so that way there's enough on there. I like to have a little bit of give so that it can kind of help hold that eye in. Now also notice there's a line. Can you see that line that's up on the top of that eye there? That line on these reflective eyes is a marker for the the position that they want you to to set these i guess it's a vertical mm -hmm. marker so when you when you set these these eyes unlike other glass eyes they do have an upward position um and the reason is is because these pupils when you look at them very very carefully are not completely centered in that eye they are actually up just a little bit, which helps when you're doing your eye setting, because if you look at a lot of the reference on these, you'll notice that the pupil does not, it's not usually lower, it's usually riding higher, and part of it is typically covered by the top eyelid. So this kind of helps us get that effect. But you wanna make sure you put those dark lines facing up, because then you'll, otherwise you'll have the pupils doing funny things. Mm -hmm even if you set them right. So now that I got both eyes in, there's a little bit of room in there and that's okay. I'd actually, I'd rather have a little bit of room to be able to kind of tweak and move these eyes as I want them. And just really get dead set in front of these eyes when you're doing this and make sure that they appear to be looking at whatever area you want them to be looking at. You don't want your eye looking like they're cross-eyed. Um, Tom, you're really good at explaining angles and different things like that. <laughs> no, I can explain it too. Uh, um, I don't know. I'm, I'm, think about the animal that you're doing. Um, I always say something that's preyed upon most of its life is worried about what's behind it. So. A rabbit's eyes, for instance, are very, very flat to their heads. Um, a bird is very flat to their head. Fish are flat to the sides of their head because there's always something bigger that's going to eat them. Um, animals uh, that prey upon other animals tend to look forward. Now, you need to be careful. Um, now, a bobcat is a pretty voracious predator. Um, and you're, everybody's gonna say they look forward, but make sure that you don't make them look perfectly forward or they kind of look like headlights. You're gonna get big bulges out the sides where you're, the back corners of your eye and, and you, you won't know what to do there. So I oh, will put clay there, you know, you see that a lot where there's big bumps back here because they set the eyes too far forward. Right. Um, so the more of a predator the animal is, the more forward he looks, but be careful that you don't make them perfectly parallel um, there are so many experts out there that tell you uh, degrees and when you're trying to determine degrees on something round, a globe, an eyeball, um, I don't think there's anybody that can do anything other than an educated guess. You know, you're going to hear people say, um, you know, deer are 45. Well, deer are 45 because they have tremendous peripheral vision. They also have very good frontal vision. And yes, there may be 45, maybe 46, maybe 44, you know. Right. I mean, right. you're gonna have to look at your reference, think about the animal, and uh, kinda, kinda determine just where he falls in the food chain. Mm -hmm. Looks like we have Kevin Yates all the way from Australia that oh, says wow. hi. And Sarah DeJournet, um, unfortunately missed last week, but she is super glad to be tuning well, welcome, in this welcome, week. Welcome. We like doing this for you guys, it's really fun. We do this stuff every day, day in and day out, whether it's a, a fish or a bird or a bobcat or a tar. Um, so it's kind of fun to set some of these projects aside just to show you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think now, the eyes look like they're pretty good. 
This mannequin here was actually sculpted with, with a little bit of width there. Sometimes I prefer to do it out of clay, sometimes I'll use the mannequin. So you can really kind of pick either or. And I'll show you just the different ways of setting it with or without. The clay we're using is critter clay. We really, really like critter clay for doing all of our eye setting and a lot of our different face work. Um, so I usually will take it and roll it up into just kind of a nice little little point on one end. And I'll start up on the top here, on the right at the front corner of that eye, right, right above where we carved that little slit for the car knuckle. And I'm just gonna kinda lay it around up in here. And as I'm doing that, I'm just kinda pressing it down onto the eye. Now it's still sitting a little high, so we'll just kinda push it down a little bit. And you're gonna notice when she gets done, I always tell people your mannequin should start looking alive. And when Amber gets done with these eyes, um, you're gonna see what I mean. It's gonna start to look like a, a living mannequin. Mm -hmm. Now I'll do the exact same thing. I'm gonna come right below where that carnacle area would be. And this one is much smaller, much thinner than the top eyelid. So I just kind of take it nice and easy. Don't put on too much clay. You don't want him to look like he's got a black eye. And everybody takes measurements, nose to eye measurements, because that's what the um, supply companies ask for. Don't forget to take width measurements between, like your car uncle, like you're talking about, uh, mm -hmm. between the front eyes, even the back corner, um, that will give you angles. And um, those are very, very, very handy to have, as important as a nose to the eye is a width between the eyes, especially mm -hmm. for that specific bobcat. We, do, we even do that on deer a lot. Yeah, yeah. When you have to stretch skin, um, things start going south. Yeah. Oh, you can change. Now, notice here that I'm using, I'm using a little bamboo stick. I'm not using a metal tool. And there's a very specific reason. It's because we are using acrylic eyes. These reflective eyes are great, but they are acrylic, which means no metal. Put your metal tools away. <coughs> Do not get them out. Hide them. You don't um, want to have to gloss a acrylic eye after it's mounted. No, no. I, so, love, I love the bamboo tools. That's the simplest tool, but it's one I grab all the time in my toolbox. I do too. They are great. They're really nice. It can get a little bit difficult to get used to because they do have a different feel um, than a metal tool. But Looks like we have Jackalope Taxidermy that says thank you for the cool video, and he's all the way from Belgium. Oh, wow. Wow. Huh. And then John Bellucci is here. He's a little late to the dance, Bellucci, but he's ready to post, boogie. Your post <laughs> of all your pictures and all your measurement sheets were just tremendous. Can't thank you enough for those type of information that people this day and age that buy a mannequin and we're mount something quick we're don't know what those people had to go through. Sure. Fabulous information. Sure. Um, and then, so I've kind of got a basic shape going here of the eye. Um, the next thing before I get too crazy is, is I'll stand up and I'll come to the side of the animal. I want to look at it from the side. And this is where I think a lot of these small mammals or, or any mammals, um, when people are setting these eyes, they forget to come and look at it from the side. And when I do that, I want to be able to see, and I'm gonna turn this here so you can kind of see. I wanna be, you can go ahead and just so you can stay at the side here. I wanna be able to see this triangular shape. And so I, whenever I'm doing this, I'll try to take that back corner and push that clay back until you're starting to see that white of the eye. That's kind of a good marker. You don't want a lot of white showing unless he's got a dramatic eye turn. So kind of take that into consideration. But this is a really good marker to know. Um, if, you, if you don't come to the side, a lot of times what happens is people get carried away and they'll start setting their eyes and they'll end up with something like this. And it'll look like they've got goggles on. Um, it blocks out all of that side peripheral vision. And I think that's 
that's a that's a biggie. It seems like I see that pretty regularly. That's big on deer. It's big on mm -hmm. uh, bobcats, fox, coyotes, wolves, everything. Mm -hmm. So that white, just kind of make a mental note, set your eye and everything, but don't forget to kind of stop yourself and come to the side and just take a look. And you know, can he can he see you if he's from the side? I'm just gonna take a brush and just kind of clean it up. And with the brush, this is when I can open up the eye, close up the eye. I love doing all of this with a brush and just smoothing out that clay. And again, this clay here, this is, this is mannequin right there. We're not building it way up. We don't want them to, to be puffy eyed. We just want to make it that nice transition from the clay right on to the mannequin. It's nice because you can kind of see a little bit of the reflective eye here in the video. Can you? Yeah. It's neat. It, they are neat. It doesn't take very much light to, to get them to show, so they're cool. It looks cool. like we have Dave McKinney checking in here from Alabama and John Cranford all the way from Atlantic Beach. Let's see. It looks like Tom. I guarantee oh. you, here, if you do here. these for your customers, they will have a flashlight very close to their bobcat. Is it showing it in the video how cool it is? Oh, yep, right there. <laughs> and it doesn't Pretty show neat. unless you want it to show. Sure, sure. So once I get one eye done now, now I'm just gonna come on over and I'm just gonna match the same eye. But instead of watching me do this for a second time or you can go back and forth, I think we we're gonna maybe pop the ears off. Talk about ears. Yeah. So these ears, like Tom said, we'll put on with critter clay and then we glue it over the top. And when you glue over the top and let them sit, they get a nice hard candy shell on them. So they're pretty durable and they're stuck on there. I mean, they're, they're good and stuck. We have to be able to remove this ear in order to put it into the hide and then put the hide on afterwards. So in order to do that, I'm just gonna take and take a knife and just kind of score along and remove that remove that ear from the mannequin. We do the same system with with deer too and mm -hmm. kind of the reason is is because teaching students um, if they take a tennis ball of clay and pack it into the ear skin um, they get big ears they get small ears they get all different size ears and funny lumps and bumps if we force them which and try to teach them a little bit about anatomy and teach them um, the different musculature of the ear, um, we got a lot of casts to go by and things like that, they uh, learn a little bit more and even if they go back to actually stuffing the ear skin, um, they tend to do it a little more right. Sure. And, and better uh, it looks a little bit better. Why, why the lumps and bumps mm -hmm. are where they're at. Yep. And so now, now that we took this off, you can kind of see where that clay is. It's going to make a really nice little index right back into place when we go to spit that in the skin. So I like having that. I can just kind of feel, you can even, because we're going to be working blind through the hide. So I like to even kind of feel, where's the hole? There it is. Okay. Slide that ear back into place. And that clay will stay somewhat soft enough um, that you can manipulate it with your, skin, with yeah. your fingers. Yep. Okay. Um, why don't you go ahead and set that other eye for them and I'll visit with them a little bit about um, ears. Now something that, that a lot of people do, and if you look at the mannequins, a lot of the mannequins will have a hole or an indent where the ear canal connects. This is a bobcat skull, a um, little bit smaller than the one Amber's doing. But what people tend to do is they tend to take an ear from the supply company and connect it there. And when they do that, they're never gonna get the ear up on the head like it should be because there is a ear canal that leads to the eustachian tube that connects onto here. And that ear canal, when you skin something is the time to look at this, um, that ear canal all animals are very similar. You actually trim off when you're skinning, but there's gonna be a canal 
on no matter what ear you use that comes off of here. This is one that we cast for a sculpture that Amber entered in the world. And it's gonna be like that, which actually positions this ear much higher than I would have positioned it if I didn't allow for that, that ear canal. So when you're positioning ears, don't forget that there's a very thin little canal. Remember when you're skinning anything, whether you're skinning a bird or skinning a bobcat or a coyote, um, you try to get deep enough so you get just a little pea-sized hole in the ear canal. As you do all your fleshing and everything, you end up cutting that off. So make sure you allow a little bit of distance. Um, I don't know, my ear canal fell off. But so that you're not setting that ear way down there like so. Um, can you hand me that bobcat head over there? And yes. Tim Sinsowski would like to know why you're using clay over the glue. Glue over the clay. Yes. Um, glue over the clay because um, we usually set them for several hours or overnight. And that glue dries down on that clay and it's almost like encasing it in a plastic bag and your clay does not crumble off your deer ears or your, your bobcat ears. Um, when we do it on deer, same thing. We set the ears the day before and they pop off if you glued them and the clay all stays intact. Um, it doesn't work regular stoneware clay. Um, it has to be critter clay because it's much stronger clay. And then we just put a high paste over it. And it makes it really nice to handle them. And you the can clay use clay doesn't squish. And it keeps the clay from drying out so that it's going to crumble. Um, now, something else, when you use, you're taking an ear liner that you buy, you're going to order your bobcat, you're going to get all your parts, your ears and things. This is all soft tissue up here. Right now, made out of foam, there's nothing soft about it. Um, this is an ear that's very soft and it doesn't conform at all to a styrofoam head. If you saw Amber last week, she cut out, this is a dotted line she drew, and you can see how she cut that out and she test fitted her ears up there so this webbing actually almost comes together from side to side, this webbing. Um, but you can't do it. Um, and the supply companies don't know how what position you're gonna put your ears in, um, whether they're gonna be back or forward or one back, one forward. So it's important that you um, realize that there's, a, there's meat over here that's nice and soft. This is soft, this can conform. It's gonna stick up a little bit and that ear can pivot back, it can pivot forward. It's gonna have a scutiform cartilage just like a deer does but it's kind of nice to have these parts um, to play with. Another thing on ears that I like is when we, before we skin an animal, we always take, in the position that we're thinking we're wanting, we always take width measurements of this webbing. Um, the, if the animal, if you make him look um, in the attitude that you want, measure your ear tips and take a note of the angle that those ears are. Are they straight out like dragonfly wings or are they up at 45s or are they very, very alert? That's gonna make the difference whether he looks like a bobcat or a coyote or a sick bobcat or a coyote, you mm -hmm. know? So pay attention to that sort of thing. Denny Riggs says that he has been told that the more water you, water you put on your clay, the worse it cracks. Um, I'm not sure about critter clay, but you don't wanna turn it into mud either. Right. So be careful that you don't make mud out of it. Um, and yes, I think if you use any of the potter clays and things like that, um, it would probably want to crack. Looks like we have Tanja Grunge all the way from London, England, and oh, she guys. has yeah. learned a lot about eyes already from all of the amazing <laughs> and helpful videos. Well, thank you. Yeah. We don't know everything, but we do everything. <laughs> <laughs> right, wrong, or indifferent. <laughs> um, we, uh, we, we get to practice a lot. Um, when we, on almost all of our animals, when we take our, we take the cartilage out of the ears. Um, some animals like fox are very, have very, very fragile ears. Um, it's kind of up to you if you want to take the cartilage out or not. If you're good at it, you're patient, and you can take the cartilage out without destroying the ear edges or ripping them open, 
I would prefer to take the cartilage out. I think you're gonna get a little more natural and realistic ear. So the cartilage has been taken out of here. Now you notice, and we do this with deer too, we leave, once, once the ear narrows down into the ear canal, like down in here, we leave this. And I'm gonna tell you why. Is I was doing a black-tailed deer for a competition one time, and I didn't know how I was gonna reconstruct. Everybody has a different idea. You can um, get inserts to put down in there. You can do the epoxy. You can rebuild down in there. There's a lot of different ways of recreating that inner ear. I thought, I wonder what would happen if I left the cartilage on, which would maintain this shape. And I took the cartilage out, much like I did, he like Amber did here, down to here, and I left all that ear canal. When you look at it from the inside of the ear skin, it looks really good. And does it shrink? Sure, it shrinks. My comment from the judge was excellent inner ear detail. I didn't do anything but leave the cartilage in. Um, I've done it several times and it looks good. Um, you don't have to paint, I mean, you have to paint a little bit, but you don't have to paint epoxy and things like that. And it's a little trick we started doing with our deer. And I found some pretty, you know, big name tax firms that do the same thing. They leave that inner ear detail in the cartilage, which maintains the shape of that skin. Something for you to try. Um, okay, now, Amber, before she put these ears in and before you set your ears in your clay, make sure that you test fit these. You don't, want to, you don't want to set your ears, get them all looking pretty like this, and then all of a sudden they don't fit. You know, now you've got a problem. Now your clay is all wrecked and things like that. Yeah. So make sure that you um, test fit them before you put them onto your animal. And then, now this one was uh, kind of a belly cut, I think he was. Um, okay, I'm on the left ear, I got the correct ear. I like to turn it inside out most of the way, but leave a little pocket so that I can take this ear. Now, if I know it's going to fit and we test fitted it early and we're ready to mount, we would put glue on here. Um, we use Dermagrip and we would glue this in right now. Mm -hmm. um, we're not going to do that today. We'll do that next week for you. But then you're going to feed this ear liner with the ear butt you're going to feed it up into that ear skin now here's where if you're working on a fox i don't know how many of you um, do red fox but a red fox has very very fragile ears and the reason is i think people don't dry them good enough when they salt them mm -hmm. Um, could I have your little form rougher there? Now this ear fits really nice. And this is something, a um, little rougher tool that'll help you, especially if you have glue on. You can coax your ear skin where you want it. And I always say, no matter what animal you're working on, mount, the, mount one ear first. If that ear went well, mount another ear. Could I have your little brush over there? Yeah, there's that other one too. Um, if one ear went good, mount the other ear. Um, don't get carried away with thinking about sewing him out, sewing him up until one ear looks good, then the other ear looks good. When your ears look good, then it's time to slide this onto the mannequin. Um, you don't want, I think Amber talked the other day, you don't want any kind of drumming here that skin lays really comfortably to the back. He's got a, a little subcutaneous pouch here. All cats and dogs have them. And you noticed it when you skinned them out. And what we like to do is take a little bit of clay. So when I mount this, I would take a little ball of clay on the end of my paintbrush or some kind of tool, and I would slide it up here with a little glue on and I would stick it up into that subcutaneous pouch 
and then I would shape that. And it's kind of, if you, you'll know what I'm talking about if you skin very many animals. It's a, it's a little, part of the ear liner comes down like this, secondary. part of it makes a little hump, wow. yeah. I always called it a secondary auricle. Mm -hmm. But um, it's just a little bitty pouch in here that you're gonna wanna put back in. Um, also, I don't know if you could, if you noticed it before, but there was a little notch taken out of that ear. And bobcats have, they have a little notch. Same thing with coyotes. Um, if they've got that, that secondary flap, there is a little inward notch in the ear. And these ears don't come with those. So just like what Tom was talking about with test fitting the ear, Whenever I'm getting ready to do those ears, I'll take that ear real quick. I'm sorry, I'm gonna pull it out real quick and then I'll put it back in for you, Tom. Um, I would usually, I would usually get a hold of your ear, get it all into position so that it's all the way up to the top. Mark it with my fingers just by looking at where the skin lies comfortably, because you can kind of tell. Okay, you know that skin is comfortable there. That's where it should go. So I can tell right where that little bald area is, that actually makes that little notch in. So I would, I would put my finger on the top of it and then come through and put my finger at the bottom so my two fingers are actually touching. So I'm going like this, one on the outside, one on the inside, and then pull the ear out and make a, make a mark with a marker on one, and I usually only do it on one ear, um, and then just hold up the other and replicate it on the other ear. But that'll give you that perfect little notch, and that allows that skin to lay right in there, and it gives you that little point, like what you can kind of see here. You can kind of see how that how that comes in, and it comes in. That's because there's there's an inward indention right inside there. And your ear liners won't come with that. Right, right. So you'd have to, just like I said, just kind of take your mm -hmm. fingers and mark it. And if your ears fit, you, you'd want to make sure, and what a lot of people do is they'll do this type of thing when they're fitting their ears. Yeah. And what they're actually doing is pulling their ear skin off of the liner and you have air in there. So when the animal dries, he gets wavy ears. And you've all seen this. Um, some of you maybe have done it. You got a professional taxidermist that's competent in what he does. You want those ear edges really, really knife edge sharp, really, really pretty. Once they dry, then you can come back and you can add some loft to that hair. Um, but you want those nice, pretty, pretty edges. Um, with glue on, I can't move this over very good now. Um, Line up your little tufts so they come off the ears just like your reference shows you. Make sure there's no wrinkles in here. Now, looking down inside, um, I don't know if you can see, hand me that flashlight and we'll show them. This is a pretty good inner ear look. Yep, I got all that wonderful detail in there. And we didn't do anything special. Right. That's just right. the... That's, that's the beauty of just, it. <laughs> just the cartilage holding that skin and like I said yes it will shrink and distort a little bit but it's going to look way better than trying to manipulate it yourself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's very difficult to do how's your eyes doing are you got yeah them yeah I think I think I like the the look that I'm going for right now and they can kind of change and 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 whatnot just you know the best thing to do before you before you mount any animal is get out your reference you know grab a grab a reference book um this book here is wonderful it's got wonderful eyes ears face expressions and um nose and everything i mean this is this is a wonderful book to be able to really get good details so get that back on and he'll start looking pretty catty <laughs> you know and don't forget your domestic cats a domestic cat is going to tell you a whole lot about felines. Um, I can't tell you enough how good of a reference a friendly cat is. Mm -hmm. um, from eyes to eye attitudes, from nostrils to lips um, to ears, you know, your yeah. cat has it all. Yeah. And kind of depending on, on the attitude of the cat, you know, it'll depend on what his eye, eyes do. If he's got more of that, that, 
alert, intense kind of look. Um, a lot of times on felines, this position in the back, more of this part of the eyelid on the top will be your highest point. If he's more of a relaxed position, it'll kind of be more like a canine where, where his highest point, and even like a deer, mm -hmm. where his highest point would be more of that one, two up in here. So just really make sure you look at reference. And we um, do a lot of three cornered eye sets on our, on our, on our mammals. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I was talking to Corey one time and Corey said, yeah, birds have that. I never thought of a bird having a three cornered eye set. Sure. Um, but we started with deer and we're oh, yeah. very familiar because we do so many um, deer and uh, it's the same thing with um, bobcats and coyotes and fox. Mm -hmm. The wider their eye is open, um, the number two corner is not as sharp and the number three corner is not sharp. Mm -hmm. this, this would be my number two, this would be number, number three, that would be one. Um, as he um, gets more slinky and cunning and focused on something and closes his eyes a little bit, um, your third corner is going to be a really sharp angle. Mm -hmm. um, your front corner is going to be a very sharp angle. And your second corner may get rounded out a little bit. So kind of look at your reference just like uh, Amber said, and that will show you. Pick out something and copy it. Another thing is your, when you're working with these, um, we reinforced all these legs because we cut all those legs off and we changed them into the pose that the customer wanted. Um, now you don't wanna be trying to put an, a leg onto a piece of wood or a rock or something like that and break it off. So yeah. there's a pretty substantial um, rod going down. You can use threaded rod. Threaded rod works really good if you don't have to bend it back and forth. Bend it back and forth a couple times, a lot of times it breaks. Um, I think we have just wire in here, like number maybe 10 gauge 10. wire. Mm -hmm. And uh, just make sure all of your wires are very parallel, uh, both from the side and from the front, and that they slip down on and pull back off so you don't have to be bending a lot of, yeah. A lot of legs. Yeah, I'm, I'm always paranoid about about whenever we fix legs, and, you know, or or even if the mannequin comes with the legs removed and sure. then just foaming them on. Ooh, I feel sure. a lot better with the with the rod and bondo in there, and that way I don't have to have my day destroyed in the middle of bonding. <laughs> if something if something broke, if it's oh, still together, the we'll on. shoot some epoxy in there, and yeah, it works good. All right, and for everybody who is on right now, make sure to give this video a share and also comment in the comment section after you do so, so we can see that you shared. Sometimes um, your accounts are set to private, so you get hidden when we go to choose our live winner. So. And we have something to give away? Yes, we are giving away Critter Clay today. A bag of Critter Clay. Yeah. Critter Clay is a good product from Ave Studio, mm -hmm. and uh, we use it for, Cool. Deer eyes, we use it for ears. Um, it's a very, very strong clay. It's not like <coughs> regular potter's clay that, that uh, you could break real easily. It's extremely strong. Yeah, this and, stuff gets so hard, it's hard to push a pin through it. We use it in our it's feet, we use it in our ears, we use it in our eyes. It's a good product. Mm -hmm. And you can get it in five pounds or 25 pound blocks, I think. I think, yeah. yeah. So, the winner's gonna get a box of critter, five pound box of critter clay. Yeah, and that'll do quite a bit. Um, just like we did with the with this up in here with the ears, we also like to do the exact same thing. Sometimes, like here, I kind of recreated some of the wrinkles because he's got a pretty aggressive head turn. Um, sometimes I'll come through with some clay and some glue and clean up any of those spots. So if there was any holes left over from when we screwed it together mm -hmm. or anything like that you could just take some clay and fill any of those holes if we would leave it for any period of time even an hour if it's a really thin layer of clay <coughs> this will just crack right off and crumble so and again that's why we did it with the with the glue so again we would just take some derma grip glue works really good um, could use like you said caulking and go over the top and that'll help keep that solid underneath until you get that skin on. And this is going to be a really attractive <coughs> bobcat. Mm -hmm. 
All right, and if you haven't done so already, make sure to go and subscribe to our YouTube channel where we have added all of our previously recorded live videos. Um, our YouTube channel is Matuska Tax Stormy Supply Company. And the nice thing about YouTube is it's very user friendly. Um, you don't have to have a Facebook account to watch them. Um, they are all in sequenced order. Um, so you never have to miss anything if there's ever a Thursday that you are unable to tune in. Um, so make sure to give that a subscribe and also follow our Instagram page, Matuska underscore taxidermy. There's about every topic under the sun. We got a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. We had a hundred a long time ago. Yeah. No, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So now the rest of the process for this is um, next week, what, what we like to do is, um, this is my philosophy, is I like to mount the head. Um, first of all, make sure that this fits. Don't get to this point and not know if it's going to fit. Once you have your form rough together, um, we test it kind of often. I test it mm -hmm. several times to make sure everything's gonna come together. I don't wanna make the cat smaller than what the customer brought in. I check my measurement sheets. I will measure the mannequin once I get him altered. Then we'll test it in, make sure everything comes together. Uh, then my method is I wanna mount that head and I wanna make that head look like a bobcat. Um, and the reason for that is <laughs> if you have a bobcat and his head kind of looks like this as you're sewing up the legs, you're going to look at him and go, oh, you know, you're not going to have any energy <laughs> to sew up the legs or the belly because this is what he looks like. But we will take our heads and we will mount them almost to the finished product, finished stage. Yep. We will groom the ears. We will set the eyes. We will tuck the nose. Um, we, we will tuck the lips. Daddy. We want him looking just like a bobcat. Then, as you sew, you're going to go stitch, stitch, stitch. Oh, man, he's going to look cool. Yeah. Stitch, stitch, stitch. And you keep looking at that face because it looks so good. You get excited, and the sewing goes good. Yep. But if he looks like this, and you're sewing him up, mm. you're not going to have a very good-looking bobcat. It's all <laughs> a mental game when yep. you sew up the life size. Um, something else. Um, oh, I was going to say. You notice on the whiskers, this skin has no whiskers. When we flesh our bobcat, we want to get that whisker pad extremely thin because it's thick, it's fatty, there's a lot of tissue, and as it dries, if you leave it that way, it will shrivel and distort, and it will give you a terrible finish on that whisker pad. As we flesh, if you flesh it thin, your whiskers are gonna fall out. We take a notebook, we write the customer's name, we pull every major whisker out, um, and I, you can see where they are. There's one there, one there, one there, one there. He's got like four of them on the top, and there's rows. There's gonna be four major rows, and you can see the little dark tufts of hair every place there was a whisker. We have row one on the left side, and we put it in a notebook and we put a piece of masking tape over it. We have row two on the left side and so on and so on and so on. Then we have a little sketch on the right side. We will mount that bobcat. After he's dried, we think we got a really nice product. Um, then we will take a pin, a T-pin, and we'll make a hole and we'll watch our angle and our um, angle up, angle down, angle back, angle forward, and we'll put a pin in there dip the whisker that goes there in a little bit of Elmer's glue or Mod Podge, pull the pin out. This sounds very difficult. It's way easier than you think. Sure. Stick the whisker in, twist it to the angle you want, go to the next one, go to the next one, go to the next one. It'll take you about 15, 20 minutes to do one side. Then you're gonna come back, you're gonna do the same on the other side. Poke a pin, poke a pin, poke a pin, poke a pin. Keep your pin all at the same angle. If it was a bobcat that was snarling and, and his whiskers are all splayed out, they go like that, then you're not gonna keep the same angle, you're going to follow that format. And uh, we think we do some pretty nice whisker arrangements, but we do it manually. A lot of people will take and cut a big old hollow out of here, a lot of mannequins come that way, with a big hollow, they fill it full of soft clay, they flesh between the whiskers, which is harder than you think for me, when they mount it, they press 
those whiskers into there and shape them. Um, it doesn't work for me as good as pulling them. I, I get a nicer job pulling them. But anyway, if you're wondering, that's why we pull the whiskers on the cheeks and we pull the whiskers up on the top of the head. Yep. And we've tried it on deer, but there's too many, so. Yeah, there's a lot. <laughs> and they're, they're little, little, little guys. Mm -hmm. but. Yeah, and it's nice too for when you, when you pull the whiskers, because we, I, I do a lot of back brushing. And yeah. when you have all those whiskers on there, yep. you can't back brush around it, and it just seems like it, it's hard to get that fluff back to the muzzle. So. And here was also, I don't know if we had this hideout last, last week, but Amber was telling you about this distance right here. When you flesh this thin, that little isthmus between the cheek hair here and the cheek hair here um, spreads out pretty wide, you know. Mm -hmm. All right, that's that's approaching a quarter inch wide. Yep. So when when she got this mannequin ready, remember she cut a little valley there under the nose, and that is so that she can tuck that skin together, and you almost get hair to hair. You won't have that big black stripe. Um, you see that on people mounting fox all the time. They get a big black stripe right down the center, mm -hmm. and then they don't know what to do with it, so they take brown or black and they paint it. Um, that's a real meaty area. I've seen you take clay and put it there. Then yep. you tuck your tuck your skin and then you push that clay together that keeps a nice fine line. There can be a line, but not a quarter inch gap of hair. Yeah. Yep. So next week we're gonna proceed. Mount the face. Mount the face. Finally. <laughs> Finally. Finally. <laughs> um, once you mount the face and the face looks really, really nice. Um, then we kind of go to the paws mm -hmm. and take care of the paws. That's another thing. I don't know if we told them. Um, are those in that one? Um, yes, they are. Mm -hmm. Typically, an animal at rest, a, a bobcat at rest or mountain lion at rest, typically you're not going to find those claws. They're retracted. They're way up inside of the, you know, they kind of roll right back. Um, you can look at any anatomy book or um, there's a lot of diagrams on the internet of how they work, the mechanics of a claw. Mm -hmm. um, coyotes and, and other bears. animals, bears, they come right off the end of the toe. Not so with a cat. They lay beside the toe and they curl up. They hinge all the way back. Um, it's very difficult to do that for me mm -hmm. um, on something like this with foam. You have to really sculpt your pause very very carefully and then you never are going to get the slot right no matter what you do with clay and things like that people try to do it with clay and it turns into mush in there um, we oftentimes will take the claws pull them all the way out cut around them remove the claws the major claws on the front and sew up the slit yeah. that way an animal like this he could have his back claws he's pushing off you can show those <coughs> but not so much on those resting. <coughs> so John says to not try that method with river otters. Um, and then it looks like no. Carlina um, Thebo, who <coughs> she says that it's great information. She doesn't do taxidermy. She, however, she loves learning about it. But she would like <coughs> to know why is it difficult with river otters? Which part? With the toes or with the... Whiskers? What's he, with the whiskers? <laughs> yeah, I did that with that last one. Yes. With that last one. Whew, yeah, you're right. It takes a while. <laughs> and otters have major Three, whiskers. Three, well, and they, they don't just have these, they have these, these. these. Right, 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 right. <laughs> yep. Okay, should we give away some clay? Yes, and it looks like she was wondering if we could get a close-up view of the whiskers again. Of the missing whiskers? Yes. Okay, now here's the hair side. Now, if they're little, if they're little bitsy guys, don't pull the little ones. You'll never keep track of them. You'll never get them back in. Just the major ones. And then here's what this looks like. Um, something that works good to clean around these also is a Dremel tool. Mm -hmm. After the skin, let it dry a little bit and you can flesh really good on the inside of that face with a Dremel tool. Yep. And if you go to remove it, a lot of times I'll just, I'll flesh on there and then flip it over very carefully just take your fingers and, sure, and they come out and they just yeah. and if they don't come out you know and it's not a major whisker leave it yeah 
It looks like Mitchell Culture says he would love to learn about taxidermy. Um, we have an awesome taxidermy school along with all of our live videos. Our school of taxidermy. Yeah, um, if you'd Best like taxidermy school. information about that, we would love to send you um, a packet um, so you can send us your email or whatnot. Um, we have trained some very, very, very There's a lot of them out there, Tom. <laughs> we, yeah, we've had hundreds and hundreds oh, and hundreds. Man. We've been doing this since 1986, 87, 88, somewhere in there. All right, well, I think it is time to announce our live winners from last week. Um, Craig Sloan or Larry Lamfret, um, whoever tunes in first. Um, and like we said, we are giving away Critter Clay this week. Have you seen them on there? I have not, so we will see if they are tuned in today. Get you a couple Should minutes. Should a number? Uh, we will... Oh, it looks like Larry Lamfred is here. So okay. congratulations okay. on your critter play. Um, and don't forget, um, from now until tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. Central Time, we do have 15% off all of our products that were used in our live. And I'll just give you a, a quick show of how to um, get there. So it looks like we are at our website right here. And then you will just go up to supplies. And then down here, you can see that we have our top sellers at the World Show, um, all of our new products, um, some of Tom's favorites. And then right here, we have our Facebook Live featured products, and you can use code FBLIVE15 at checkout. So, uh, who knows? <laughs> um, all right, well, we will see you guys next week, um, next Thursday at 3.30. For part four. Thanks for tuning yes. in. Thank you. Um, hopefully it'll be about, there might be a five or a six. We might do some habitat for you. And, sure. And sure. Uh, we got to do pause. We got to sew. Um, we won't watch, we won't make you watch every stitch. We'll, <laughs> we'll get it set up and maybe sew it during the week. Sure. All right. And don't forget to share this video and comment shared in the comment section. You will have until next Thursday um, to share to be entered in for our um, giveaway next week. So. And I get to study cat reference because I get to take Quinn to Lion King tonight. Oh, <laughs> that'll be exciting. I think we all should see that movie. <laughs> all right. Thank you for tuning in. I hope we helped in some of your difficult areas. Mm -hmm. Reference, mm -hmm. reference, reference. Let me see.